Welcome to Leaders Upgraded, the place where people who want to upgrade and fast track their career, their life and their leadership journey tend to gather. I am your host, Tanvi Gautam, and I shall be speaking to the top 10% of the world's leading authors, CEOs, coaches and thinkers to bring you some of the best and brilliant ideas to fast track your way to success. Would you like an upgrade? Let's do this. So hi, everyone, and welcome to this session with a very, very special guest today. We are going to be talking to Dr. Dawn Graham from the Wharton School, who is the author of the book Switchers, The Smart Professional's Guide to Changing Career and Seizing Success. She has more than two decades of experience as an executive coach and recruiter. She has helped many, many executives with their personal branding, their job search, as well as negotiating good compensation packages. Let me tell you this. If you are serious about your career, you need to know Dawn and read the book. It is an incredible book that I wish I had when I was switching careers, but you are lucky enough that she wrote it for you already. So welcome, Dawn. Oh, thank you. I'm excited to be here. You know, I was so intrigued even just by the title of your book, right? Switchers, because, mm -hmm. you know, the whole conversation in the world of disruption that we talk about, it, we will find that people are having maybe even two or three different careers in a lifetime. And I'm not talking jobs, careers in a lifetime, because, you know, we are evolving, the industry is evolving, jobs that were there yesterday are not there tomorrow. And so this career agility that is needed for switchers, I think is a really important thing for us to consider as we talk about career success. I'm curious though, what was your inspiration behind writing the book? So yes, people have two, three, 10 careers in their lifetime, but we're still using applicant tracking systems and outdated hiring methods. So what I saw were very talented people with transferable skills getting stuck because they were applying online or getting caught in these ATS applicant tracking systems and not even getting the chance to interview or to show their skills. So what I realized was that we have two options, change the system, which would be lovely, but that's, that's for another book, or teach people how to get around that so that they can get in front of the decision makers and share their skills and show how they could do the job. Once you figure out what you wanna do, get around those biases and obstacles and land the job. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. You know, the recruitment process in and of itself leaves a fair deal to be desired. And then I don't think the capability for dealing with switches is, is quite as existent as we, we would want to assume. And nothing against recruiters, but I think there is, there is a spectrum on how many of them even understand when people are trying to make the switch because we have people from organizations like Unilever who are talking about how many more applications they can process in the age of artificial intelligence and get through resumes quickly and, and, and all of that. And I know you have a very, very interesting position on why if you are looking for a switch, this is not the way to go. Would you be able to share with us as to what you think is the issue if people decide to go down this path and what is the alternative that you suggest for them? So, and I, I would even make that broader. I would say it's not just switchers. I would say that most job seekers today, if you're applying online, you're really limiting yourself to about 20% of the jobs that actually exist. We know that if you're a hiring manager or if you're, you are somebody who's looking to fill a position, the first thing you're going to do is go to your network. You're going to look at who have I worked with before or maybe who in the organization is a star performer that I might want to poach and bring into my department. And so many jobs get filled this way that they don't even make it to the online systems. And I know that job seekers believe that the hiring process is linear and logical and unbiased and objective. But I can promise you as somebody who's been recruiting for a number of years that though they may try, it's just not. It's run by humans who are trying to, like you said, process applications, find the best candidate. They're, they're juggling too many job requisitions and they're just trying to get these positions filled. And if they have a referral come in or if they have an internal applicant at the 11th hour, that person is going to have the advantage. So, so when you're applying online, you have to recognize that you're 100% of the people are competing for 20% of the jobs. 
And so when you can step away from the online systems where you don't even know if those jobs are real because they may have an internal applicant waiting or they may have uh, filled the job and it's still online because they didn't take it down, that, that you can take this energy and the job search is so frustrating to begin with that you don't need it to be more frustrating. And you could put that into other strategies that actually work and help you access all of the jobs that exist and help you be that candidate who is a referral. And a lot of people think, well, that's scary and it's unstructured and it's ambiguous and I, I don't know what to do. But I think that's what Switchers does is it, it here's the process. Here's exactly how you do it. And yes, it takes some effort, but it's probably not as hard as you think. Mm. You know, I kept thinking when I was looking at this, because I do a fair deal of work on inclusion as well in organizations, right? And I think right now the pendulum is on an upward swing towards going towards the artificial intelligence and the application tracking systems and all of that. But given the fact that ultimately even, you know, the process of post, let's assume you did somehow make it through that selection system. And then you get in and then you meet these people who are humans mm -hmm. and they have their own biases and all of that. I feel like the industry, and right. that's, that's a conversation for a different podcast. And I, you know, I'll probably pose it to the panel of recruiters we'll have over. But I think the pendulum will probably swing somewhere in the middle. I think people are kind of getting carried away with this online thing. And I totally agree with you that you know, if, if, if that's all that you're relying on, you're really shortchanging yourself. And you know, we, we can't beyond a point be putting a faith in that job, which, you know, like you said, I have heard of so many really qualified people going through the whole interview process, flying across the country and all of that. And then some, they hear it through the grapevine. The boss's favorite is being moved into that position. So it's just a charade, mm -hmm. you know? So it really uh, is. I always, it's not the most qualified person that gets the job. It's the CEO's nephew. And that's, that's only partly a joke. The fact is, is that connections are really what open those doors. And that's what I want for people. I want the doors to be open so that if you want to make a switch, or even if you're not a switcher and you just want more opportunities to assess, then this book will teach you how to access those opportunities that you're not going to find online. True, true. So in the book, you talk about how certain types of switches are, are easier to make than others others, right? So walk us, if you will, in that differentiation of what's the biggest leap that is the most difficult one to make? Because I know of Morgan Stanley bankers who have left to set up their own cupcake shops. And that is like a massive leap. But of course, they're working for themselves. So it's a different conversation. But even if you're staying in the corporate world, there are varying levels of difficulty in the type of switch you're <laughs> attempting. So talk to us about that gradation, if you will. Yeah, so essentially the further you stray away from your traditional career path, the harder the job search is going to be. So one of the easier switches to make is an industry switch. So if you're in a specific function and maybe you do that function in pharma, but you want to move and do that function in you know, retail, that's going to be a little bit of an easier sell. The, the next level of difficulty comes when you make a functional switch. So if you're making a functional switch, it's actually the work you're doing day to day. So maybe I'm in marketing, but I want to be in human resources. You're changing your function. And then of course, the most difficult would be the double switch. So you're changing both industry and function in one fell swoop. And again, that's because you're straying so far away from the traditional path that it's going to take more effort. But I've seen a number of people do it. And I think what really helps them do that is recognizing that they need a solid strategy. You can't just slap a resume up online and make a double switch. But if you do plan out how to do that and the steps to take, which is what the book talks about, you can make that switch. And I think too many people have either been told or they've applied and they haven't gotten any response and now they believe that they can't do it. And, and I, that's so frustrating to me because most of the time it's not that that individual is not capable. It's that our hiring systems are not designed to open the door for them to even have a shot. I, I, I agree. You know, I often, I joke about this at HR conferences when there are recruiters in the room. I tell them, I said, if Steve Jobs had applied to your organization for a job, chances are that somebody in the recruitment team would have looked at his resume and said, you know, this guy, he's got a three years gap on his resume. He was sitting in some <laughs> ashram in India. We don't want him. <laughs> they would have rejected him right <laughs> off the bat. 
And that's because, you know, the ability of organizations and hiring managers and recruiters to, to understand that gap that is there in the resume. And, you know, we tend to think that that's only, you know, <clears throat> women returning to work. I don't think that's the case. I think there is the switchers, uh, the resumes can look very, very eclectic because they could, you know, have switched industries or functions or, you know, sometimes people, you know, people hold it against you that you've been job hopping too much, but what you really have been doing is some soul searching because you're like, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, this is not the job I want. I don't want to be here. And then, you know, explaining all of that becomes very difficult. And I, I have to thank you, Don, because this book does such an in-depth and fabulous job of laying the roadmap. And when you understand how the hiring process works, you can manage this. So one of the first things I share is that initially the hiring process is about elimination, not selection. And that often blows people's mind because they say, what are you talking about? And I say, look, before they can narrow it down to three, four, five candidates, they have to get rid of 200 candidates. And so the mind, the way the brain is, is working is it's looking for those easy outs. And it could be a gap on your resume. It could be a switcher. It could, you know, and this is human bias. It doesn't mean you're not qualified. They're just looking to make this easy. And the brain is functioning very differently during this process. And then towards the end, when you're in the top three or four, now it's about selection. So you have to manage your job search that way. And when you do that and you understand what's going on, you can come up with a completely different strategy that gets you in the door. And that's really what I want people to understand is that this is what's happening. I think one of the things, Don, that's very interesting to me is that I think the way careers are going, we are seeing fields coming together. I can see the influence of marketing coming mm -hmm. into human resources when we are talking about, you know, career journeys and, and the, you know, personas of people who we want to recruit and all of that. So I think the conversation also is shifting. But till recruiters realize that it's actually people who have worked at intersections who are the real asset nowadays for organizations, chances are the recruiter or hiring manager at the moment, who hasn't been as enlightened as we would like them to be, will look at you and say, why should I be taking a chance on you? You don't have the background. You don't have the experience. And I've got some other candidates who have the experience. So I want to go with someone who can hit the ground running. What is mm -hmm. your, your suggestion on how best to handle that pushback? Yes. So I would say it's interesting because if you flip the question and you say, okay, I need somebody who has 10 years of experience in sales and here's a resume of 10 years of experience in sales, but it doesn't really say how, how well you did. I mean, you could be the worst salesperson ever. So yeah, <laughs> you have the experience, you have the titles, but you, you're, you're terrible. And yes. so I think we make, we make assumptions in the other direction as well that, oh, on paper, you look great. So you're going to be a good employee. And that's not true either. So I think we need to come up with processes that enable us to dig a little bit deeper. And exactly what you said is true. Hybrid roles are, are becoming more and more common. It used to be finance or tech. Now it's fintech or health tech. And so these roles are emerging and companies who are getting it are realizing that it is, it is better to bring in somebody who has this agility because a year from now, their business is going to change in such a way that they're going to need this agility. And so one of the things I think switchers can do right up front is point out how that agility is going to be effective for the business. And, and the other thing I think that's, that's really helpful is if you've been in a, a number of industries or functions and you've been successful, I think those examples can be very powerful when you're speaking with a hiring manager or a recruiter because you can say, look, I've been thrown into these situations that were ambiguous, they had no roadmap, and I was able to be successful. And that's the kind of person you're gonna want on your team, regardless of whether I've held the right title or been in the position for X number of years. The other thing is we're, we're moving into industries that you're not going to find somebody with five, 10 years of experience because yeah. they're so new. So how are you going to hire for those roles if you can't assess transferable skills? So I think companies are going to be at a big disadvantage if they're not able to assess these skills because they're not going to be able to hire for these new roles. Yeah. So I think, and I'd love for you to maybe share an example of how we, you know, the people who are listening in can do that. 
my sense that I got from reading your book is that you really want to take the attention away from the here and now and the specifics to kind of zoom out into the bigger picture of the skill set that the person is is bringing. And like you said, you know, the transferable um, aspect of it. Yeah, I think one of the first things that I coach people to do is stop telling people you're switching, which is very common. People say, <laughs> well, I was doing X and now I'm looking to do Y. And I said, don't point out that you're exactly what they don't want. That That's number one. Second, I would I tell people to start getting into the habit of defining themselves by their value. And in the U.S. especially, we, we tend to get asked, what do you do? Where do you work? What's your title? And, and so we, we get this identity meshed and meshed with whatever our title is. And if I'm a lawyer, but I want to move into product management and I say, well, I'm a lawyer, but you've lost your audience right there. And what you need to start doing instead is, is finding those aspects of your background that add value to your audience in product management in this case and start introducing yourself that way and say you know one of the things that i do for companies is reduce legal risk around new products and how i do that is because when you start to strip the titles and the, and, and all that away and just get to that value now people can see how you're going to make an impact on their bottom line and they're not clouded by whatever assumptions they have about that title or what they know about lawyers or what have you. So I think that's one of the, the biggest things that everybody can do starting today is, is tomorrow or next time you're at an event, somebody asks you, where do you work? What do you do? Stop saying, I'm a career coach. I'm, I, I work here and start saying, well, what I do for companies is, or what I do for clients is, and start defining yourself with your value because you'll see an internal shift in yourself and you'll also see a shift in how people respond to you because it'll start a conversation where they'll say, wow, you should talk to my friend over here. Or, Have you ever looked at this company? Because they're doing similar things. The second you say, well, I'm a, um, I'm a lawyer, I'm a doctor, people assume they know what that is in conversation either ends or goes in a direction that, that you're not intending. Yeah, that is such a great piece of advice. Focus not on your title and your role. Focus on the value that you bring to the table, right? Mm -hmm. It's completely reframing and repositioning how the other person sees you. I have to I have to share this funny thing that I started doing, you know, at networking events where people, you know, really not paying attention. The way and then there's a chapter mm -hmm. on networking, by the way, in your book. And what's behind that question? So when people are asking, mm -hmm. well, what what do you do? It's not really what do you do? It is, what do you do that matters to me, right? I think you'll enjoy it. You know, people would ask me at a networking event, so what do you do? And I would say, well, I'm a, I'm a non-invasive brain surgeon. And you know, suddenly they would stop doing whatever they were doing. <laughs> that would catch their attention. Yeah, they catch their attention. Like, non-invasive brain surgeon? And uh, because I, I did my PhD, so I have like the doctor in front of my name. So they, they, they don't doubt the fact that I could be a brain surgeon. And they're like, well, how does non-invasive brain surgery work? I said, you know, I, I, I talk to people and I shift the linkages that they have between different ideas and how they look at life and like mm -hmm. rewire their brain. And they're like, wait, I love it. are you like, like in consulting and training and coaching? And I'm like, that's exactly right. But it's, it's just that ability to make the connection because I think the value that I bring to the table it, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter whether I'm working with the C-suite or I'm working with, you know, oh. the, the new hire. It, it's not, that's not the point. The point is my value at the end of the day is to help people broaden the perspective that they have on the topics that we have at hand and to see the world differently and make connections yeah. that they've not made before. Now that's industry agnostic. Right. And so anyway, that was my, my side story. I mean, I, 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 I want to, well, I love it. I love it. Because you're right, it is about making a connection and a title or, you know, something, especially if somebody doesn't understand what you do, it, it can end the conversation. So I love that because it starts the conversation. And what I would say is, I wish we could all stop asking that question, what do you do, and, and ask something more interesting, like what problems do you solve? Or, you know, something that gets to that value. And I would say, no matter what somebody asks you, reframe that question to what problems do you solve? And if you're not sure what that answer is for you, this is a great opportunity to figure that out because at the heart of that is, is likely where your motivation lies and likely where that answer to the interview question or, or the resume profile will, will help you make that switch. 
You know, I really liked that piece in the book where you talked about when you're writing about your profile to kind of think about what would they have been writing if they were going to give you a lifetime achievement award. Because Mm -hmm. I, and and the number of reasons why I like that suggestion is one, because it does allow you to shut down that negative voice in your head that keeps telling you, what have you done? Mm -hmm. What do you even bring to the table? What is it that you can possibly be saying that could be of interest and, and, you know, uh, it gives you, gives you that ah, lifetime achievement award kind of, you know, uh, aura, even if it's, you know, pretend uh, it allows you to break free from, from that, that negative uh, mindset that you have. (laughs) And it, when you people talk about lifetime achievement award, they talk about not just the milestones, but the contributions that have been made along the way. Um, yes, exactly. So I think I'm going to sit tonight and rewrite my LinkedIn bio. Thanks to you, Don. Well, yeah, I, I, I love that idea because when you think about that, you automatically think holistically. And sometimes I think we get so tied up into what we're doing today or right now, we forget the three jobs we've had before or the different careers we have before and and all of those skills that we've learned that maybe we're not using today, but we still have. And that's what I tell, I tell uh, job seekers is, you know, it doesn't matter if you did it five years ago or as a volunteer role, if you have that experience, you have that experience. And we're so, as humans, like, tied to going toward the, but I don't have, or, but I don't have. And I'll tell you this, as a recruiter, no one has a hundred percent of the qualifications, no one. So at the end of the day, hiring managers hate hiring because it takes a lot of time, takes them away from their day job. And it, they just want somebody who's going to come in, be motivated, make them look good without needing a lot of handholding. And if that's you and you can build that case, they don't have to look any further. And it doesn't matter if you're a switcher. It doesn't. Fair enough. Fair enough. So let's, let's stay with the theme of, of being able to help people see your value. And there is a chapter in the book around personal branding and personal branding yeah. Now, personal branding, and I, and I do work on this, is difficult enough even for people who are not switching because it requires mm-hmm. you to kind of get to that red thread, to that value, and then to position and package it in a way that, that the other, it appeals to the other person. But personal branding for switchers yes. is, is even more difficult, uh, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would say people are very resistant to branding, and I think that's in part because it's very ambiguous. But what I, would, what I tell people, and this is very true, whether you're consciously building a brand or not, others are building it for you. So when you start to realize that, you say, okay, maybe I do want to put a little bit more time into this because essentially it's it's your reputation and as it relates to your professional brand and, and your skills and getting a job as a switcher, it's really what value you can add to your audience. So I think step one that you really want to do is understand your audience. What pain points do they have? What problems are they trying to solve? Because that is... That is first and foremost, the most important thing. And once you know the problems they're trying to solve, then you can start to look at your background again, holistically and say, what do I offer that solves those problems? And that's really a simple definition, but that's what brand is about. If you're, you're, the pain points are mitigating risk, how can I mitigate risk? If the pain point is increasing retention, how can I increase retention? What's in my background? And, and finding examples in your background that align to that, or, or even breaking those skills down into their smaller pieces and saying, what have I done related to that? So it is a little bit ambiguous and brand is not a sentence on your resume. It's not, it's not an elevator pitch. It's kind of an abstract concept, but I think, you know, one of the best ways that I like to describe it is, and because people sometimes say, Oh, it feels like it's not genuine. But I say, if you're going to buy a car and that car has a number of features in it and, and, you know, you're a young family and you're looking for a safe car, but the salesperson is talking about the sound system and how fast it goes. And you're not going to buy that car because that's not what your pain point is. That same car can also have maybe eight airbags, child locks, and all of these other safety features. And if that salesperson leads off with those, you're gonna get you're gonna be more interested because they're addressing your pain points. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean the car doesn't have all of these other features that would appeal to somebody who wants to drive fast and, and listen to music. But the point is we all have these different aspects of ourselves. And when we can identify the pain points of our audience, we can put forth 
those that are most relevant and important to our audience to grab their attention so they want to learn more. And that's the importance of brand. We have such short attention spans today that you've got to grab their attention quickly. And when you have a strong brand, that's exactly what you're doing. How do you grab their attention and tell a coherent story that solves their pain points? Yeah, I think the flip side of it also is that just as we tend to go for the more impressive ones, I think there is also an issue that we make a much bigger deal of some parts of our career story in our head than it would be in anybody else's head because they have not been so close to that experience. It's a lot about, you know, walking in with saying, I know, I know what I'm, I'm, I'm talking about and, and I, I know I bring value to the table and somewhere convincing yourself first of that piece is even more important than convincing anybody else. And there is a part in the book where you talk about how your own ego can be, you know, the worst enemy of your, your dreams. <laughs> and one is how attached we are to our career identity and letting that go, even though we know it's not what we want to do, that can be difficult. And there's a concept called loss aversion that, that is, is very universal in humans where, where losses impact us more deeply than gains of the same value. So if you lose $20, you're going to matter about that for much longer than if you found $20 on the street. And, and so when, when we're thinking about change, any change comes with loss. So we tend to grasp onto, onto that. And if you're a switcher, the fact is there are going to be some things that are going to change, which might be your salary. It might be your level. It might be how much autonomy you have in the job. It might be that you have to travel more or you're not the boss anymore. And so I think people get really excited about a career switch until they start thinking about what they're going to lose And then all of a sudden it gets scary again. And they're like, well, maybe this isn't for me. And so I think you kind of have to reconcile that. And it's it's a stage you have to go through in this process because if you grasp so tightly to the fact that I want to make a switch, but I don't want my salary to change. I don't want to move. I don't want to travel. I don't want, I mean, the fact is you're, you're going to have a very difficult time doing that. So there's an aspect in the book, which I call the career switch tolerance questionnaire that goes through a number of questions because the fact is this may not be the best time for you to switch. And maybe that's what you learn by going through this assessment, or you may learn that, okay, I'm going to have to make a few changes. You know, one of the first things that happens in, for careers in the age of disruption is that you could wake up tomorrow morning and find you don't have a job. Yes. Uh, and, and then what are you going to do about it? And, and that's when, you know, you, you, you start thinking often times for career switching and some people's approach to making that switch is to go get a degree because, yes. you know, they think that's, that's something that can easily get them the stamp that is needed. It, you know, gives them a little bit of buffer because all said and done job loss and disruption can, it, it's a hit to your system because people are not used to thinking of themselves you know, who they are beyond their job. And I thought that you had a pretty interesting and and very useful uh, framework around whether, uh, you know, going in for that degree is the right option or not. So talk to us a little bit about that. When does it actually make sense? When does it not? And what could you possibly be doing as an alternative? Yes, I think I think a lot of people go back to school when there's a recession or when they get laid off or when they don't know what they want to do. And obviously, I'm a big fan of school. I spent a number of years in it and I work in a university. But what I would say about doing that as a switcher is experience is always going to trump coursework. And you're going to come out of that two year degree with a little bit more debt you know, you're now two years older, and you're still going to have a hard job search ahead of you. I think, again, the human brain is always looking for a path and steps. And and it seems pretty clear that, okay, if I do a degree, I know exactly what classes I need to take, and somebody's going to tell me what I need to learn and what I need to do. And so it feels like a safe path. But the fact is, is that you really need to understand the return on investment that you're going to get from this, because a lot of programs don't offer practical experiences. Uh, The career centers are not equipped to do placement. So people just assume that's what the career center is going to do. So you're still going to have that job search at the end. You're still going to have to network. You're still going to have to rebrand yourself. You're still going to have to go on interviews. And the, the degree isn't necessarily going to solve that. So what I would say is do your research 
find out how helpful this degree is to your career path, and if you could get that experience another way. So maybe a self-created internship. There, there's now something called the uh, midternships. So a lot of people are looking to change careers. I mean, companies know this, and they're they're helping people make these changes. So what I would rather see people do is to try this on, whether through volunteer or a, a gig or you know, some kind of contract or temporary role. I mean, there's so many ways you can get this experience. And yes, it's a little ambiguous. You have to be a little creative. You have to talk to people. And that's a little bit more scary than applying online or, or sitting in a classroom. But I, I promise you that, that, you know, this may be a great way to understand if you even want to do this. I had a client spend two years going to school to do speech therapy only to find out when she graduated, she hated it. And, you know, had she spent some time doing this research previously, uh, you know, before starting the degree, she would have been able to save that time. So I think another benefit of trying it on for size is, is it really everything you imagine it's going to be in your head? Because sometimes things that look great from the outside aren't really a good fit once you're inside. I agree. What's your opinion on, you know, we are seeing a lot of these certificate online programs that are coming out of universities that are being offered edX and all of that, which is it's the shortest stint and, and you get a certificate at the end of it. Do you think that's a preferred way to go than trying a full degree? I do think people can learn a lot about, you know, terminology and, you know, what the, the you know, basics are. I don't think you can go in expecting that it's going to land you a job because it's rarely going to be the case. But if you're looking at it as exploratory and informational in nature or something that's gonna grow your skills in a way that might be useful later, you know, and you have the time and support from your company, I would say go for it. But you can't go in expecting that a job or switch is gonna be on the other side. That's great advice. There was this fabulous question that is in the book, which I think, can change the game in an interview. I just, I loved it so much, which was about the final question that you can ask a recruiter. Yes. <laughs> which can turn the tide in your favor. I tell you that question alone is worth reading the whole book for. So why don't you go ahead and tell us what's that question? So yeah, so the key question, which, you know, at the end of the interview, usually you get to ask a few questions. One of the last questions I love to ask is, is there anything that concerns you about my ability to do this job or this work? And what I, again, going back to the fact that a lot of hiring managers are not trained. They get better at interviewing as they go. So if you're unfortunately the first candidate, you're probably getting a little bit of the shaft because they're learning to ask better questions as they go. And I have seen, I know it's sad. I have seen hiring managers miss key skills. We think they read the resume. I'm, I'm, I promise you there's rarely going to ever be a hiring manager who reads your full resume. They're going to skim it five minutes before you get into the room. So when you ask this question, it really forces them to think about, hey, is there anything I'm missing here? And I had a situation where when I, when I used to do recruiting, they, they needed the person to have a CPA. Well, the person did have a CPA, but it was on page two of the resume. And when I asked, well, why didn't this person get hired? Well, he didn't have a CPA. I'm like, nobody did. And it was like, oh, oh, well, we missed it. And I'm like, oh, you know, and ever since then, I'm like, okay, as a candidate, you need to leave on the table what you want to leave on the table. And this is an awesome opportunity to find out if there's anything that they're concerned about. And if they say something like, well, we're concerned this is going to be a really long commute for you. Well, now you can address it. Well, actually, my family lives out this way, so I'm here quite often, and this will give me a chance to visit more. Or if they say, actually, no, you know, there's nothing, you'd be a great fit for this. You kind of force them to psychologically close on the fact that you're a good candidate, and that's never a bad thing. It's not going to guarantee the job, but it, it does, you know, it does help a little. Yeah, and it's such a great question. I, th I, I think it, it also, it's a very authentic question, right? It's not mm -hmm. just about all about posturing. It's an authentic question. So, you know, help the recruiter, help the hiring manager hire you. That's what you're trying to do really with that question, you know, and have an open, honest conversation. <clears throat> now for my favorite question. You do so yeah. many <laughs> careers. What's the best piece of career advice that you ever got? And what was the worst piece of career advice that you ever got? Yeah. 
Well, I'm very fortunate. I got a lot of great career advice, but one of the pieces that really stand out to me, Carla Harris, who who wrote a couple of books, Strategize to Win and Expect to Win, she, you know, she was on my radio show and, and she made a statement that makes total sense, but it kind of blew my mind. And she's like, most of the career decisions that are going to be made about your career are going to happen when you're not in the room. But if you don't have a strong brand and people don't know what you want to do and what you're capable of, and you're not out there networking, you're not going to get these opportunities. It doesn't matter how stellar you are. And I just thought the way she said that, I, I of course believe in networking and branding, but the way she put that together yeah. was so incredibly helpful to hear. And I would say, I, you know, one of the pieces of career advice that I'm not a fan of is the, the follow your passion. And I feel like that puts a lot of pressure on, on people, especially younger people who have no idea yet what, what, different careers are or what's out there in the world and so I, I you know I just think sometimes it can be really misleading because things you're passionate about sometimes when they become your means of supporting yourself all of a sudden it's not very fun anymore so sometimes your passions are better off staying your passions but what I like instead is try things on and find where your professional energy is meaning that you know think about the projects you're doing at school, at work, with you know, volunteer aspects, internships, and where are you getting engaged and excited, and where are you losing track of time, and where are you, you know, doing your best work? Because chances are that's where your future career lies. So I think you do have clarity comes through action. I think the more things you can get involved in and really viscerally pay attention to how you feel doing those projects. And then taking that and becoming, you know, making that your path. Yes. So that's great. Listen, Don, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you again for writing uh, the book. I found it an incredibly useful read. We'll make sure that people have the links to find you as well as to buy the book. But it's it's been a, an absolute pleasure talking to you. I, I am grateful that you found the time. And I'm, I'm absolutely certain the audience will We'll be very happy that we invited you over for this. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes this episode of Leaders Upgraded. But wait, your journey is just getting started. Go to www.leadersupgraded.com for more insights, more inspiration, and more tools to continue the journey. And... If you have someone who you would like to nominate for the podcast or a particular topic you'd like us to cover, then also visit www.leadersupgraded.com and let us know. If you like this episode, please do share it. Please do subscribe to the podcast. And I look forward to continued upgrades with you. Take care.